I'll kind of set the stage. So hi, everybody. Um, I am Ryan Gentry, head of business development at Lightning Labs. Really excited to be kind of emceeing this discussion generally on kind of the new era of Bitcoin development, Lightning and programmability. Um, we've kind of invited as Lightning Labs a host of kind of new projects, new off-chain projects here to discuss kind of what they're working on. Um, and then just the theme of the Bitcoin renaissance generally. Um, so uh, I guess why don't we kind of go around and have you all introduce yourselves and your projects while we get everybody up here as a speaker. Um, so um, Sims and Light and Alpen, you guys just had a big announcement um, yesterday and then again today. Do you want to kind of introduce yourselves um, and your project? And then we'll go around to the rest of our invitees as they get up here. Uh, sure. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks, uh, Lightning Labs team, for putting this together. Uh, uh, hi, guys. I'm uh, Sims from Alpen Labs. Um, yeah, we just we just had some announcements today, um, but uh, you know what we're really excited about uh, is this convergence of uh, kind of two revolutions that we're seeing: one in money, Bitcoin, and the other in computing uh, with zero knowledge proofs. Uh, and sort of at that intersection, we've been over this past year, building uh, infrastructure uh, to allow uh, programmability, uh, scalability, privacy uh, on Bitcoin through, uh, you know, uh, layer two and scaling kind of solutions. And we'll unveil uh, a lot of that uh, coming soon. Uh, we're excited to uh, uh, be, be here. Hey, folks, uh, this is John Light, a newly minted uh, technical product manager at at Alpin, uh, just joined earlier this month full time. Uh, previously, was an advisor there, uh, so that's an alpha leak uh, for the folks on the call here. Um, and yeah, excited to talk about the new era of Bitcoin development. Thanks for inviting me to join. Awesome. Um, welcome, Sims and Light at the Alpin team. Um, also, Matt Luongo, uh, you had a big announcement yesterday as well. Um, welcome to the stage. Excited to hear um, what you've been working on with Meza. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, hey, all, Matt Luongo. Um, we've been working on TBTC uh, and basically Bitcoin bridging to Ethereum and Solana and all sorts of places for about five years now. And just yesterday, we announced uh, our uh, plan to extend that bridge to its own L2 called Meza. Um, I think we're taking a pretty Pretty different approach than other folks here, so excited to talk about it. Amazing. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, Super Testnet. Um, Howdy, guys. I'm a free and, I'm a free and independent uh, open source software developer. I do a lot of stuff on Bitcoin L1. I do a lot of stuff on Lightning. Um, one of the things that I've recently been helping with is uh, BitVM, and that's probably why I'm, I'm here to talk about to talk about that and what that can do. So, yeah. Amazing. Awesome. Thanks for uh, joining Super. Um, Louis from Starknet. Starkware, I guess from Starkware. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Louis. I'm the head of strategy for Starkware. Um, so when it comes to Bitcoin, Starkware, I mean, Starkware, for those who don't know about it, is one of the leading companies when it comes to zero-knowledge proofs and to and about uh, scaling using the KPs. Um, we did in Bitcoin uh, things ready to uh, we we uh, helped uh, Robin within the audience uh, start a zero sync, uh, which was the, the uh, a proof of Bitcoin, which will allow you to sync Bitcoin instantly. Uh, also, uh, John, if uh, John lies there, so we also work with John to to about this roll up Bitcoin um, um, report a couple of years ago, and getting trying to get involved more and more with with what's going on in Bitcoin and scaling on Bitcoin using zero knowledge proofs. Amazing. I'm so excited to have you here, and I'm working on getting uh, Botanix, our last guest, up. Let me try this and see if that'll let Botanix up. Um, so I'll just give it a second to see if you can join um, before moving on to kind of the next question. we got circling, circling, it's trying. Amazing. Um, Willem. Uh, welcome to the stage. Excited to have you here. You want to talk a little bit about uh, introduce yourself and your project? 
everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Awesome to be here. I think it's uh, it's a great uh, great panel here of uh, people scaling Bitcoin. Um, so Willem, um, I'm the founder of Botanix, uh, working on the Spider Chain, uh, which is now I think a paper we wrote a year and a half ago or something or a year ago. Um, I think uh, the Spider Chain is is following a different, a little bit of different model than uh, than other scaling solutions. Uh, more optimized to be uh, decentralized where anyone can join in. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Um, and then um, Elizabeth. Oh, looks like you requested. There we go. You're back up as speaker if you want to say something before we really dive in. Oh, sounds like maybe she's having audio issues. Um, cool. All right. Well, um, the Bitcoin Renaissance, that's a big theme that we've been talking about here at Lightning Labs. I'm super excited that you know all of you are building on Bitcoin. So I just kind of wanted to kick things off by going around and saying, you know, what do you see as the Bitcoin Renaissance and kind of why are you choosing to build on Bitcoin? So let's go in reverse order of what we just did. So um, Willem, why are you building on Bitcoin? What do you see as the Bitcoin Renaissance and why are you building on Bitcoin? Uh, good question. Yeah, I think... Um what became quite clear, and I think we all shared, is if uh, we want Bitcoin to be, uh, yeah, the currency of the world, um, to have a whole world running on Bitcoin. Uh, but I guess we all uh, all realized that we cannot scale Bitcoin to eight billion people. Um, and ideally, and that's where I want to build in. Like uh, I want the whole financial system in the world to be built on Bitcoin. And the financial system today has a lot of different. Uh, yeah, aspects. You have, of course, uh, stock markets and financial systems. And I don't want central banks and banks in general to be uh, to be just holding all the Bitcoin. And so uh, I think you need a lot um, infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure in the world to actually uh, run the whole world on uh, on Bitcoin, going from payments to like uh, a bunch of other applications. And I think uh, a year and a half ago, I started to realize that. Uh, yeah, Bitcoin is, of course, the winning money, but uh, I saw the EVM as being yeah, a software layer that can enable a bunch of different applications like uh, like DEXs, like Perp DEXs, um, enables uh, um, securities or tokens and a bunch of other different uh, applications. So I wanted to build a, uh, an EVM and bring that to Bitcoin, but ideally in a, in a decentralized fashion. And that's why I uh, uh, went out to design the Spider Chain. Amazing. Um, thank you, Willem. So I think, um, I can't remember if Super Testnet or Louis was next, but let's go with Louis. Um, sure. Where, why, Stark, where are you, what do you see as the Bitcoin Renaissance and why are you building on Bitcoin? Uh, so, so the Bitcoin Renaissance is perfect. That's a great, great topic. So um, the, the Bitcoin Renaissance to me, like we see starting with Taproot, um, we see like, you know, a bunch of things that just were not possible or not imaginable before starting to be you know, to be explorable, at least, something we can look into. Uh, and that's what Taproot enabled. And so, to me, and what I want to see build on Bitcoin, and which is currently lacking, is make Bitcoin the source of truth. Not only the source of, you know, the hardest money there is, but also the source of the end point, the backbone of what who owns what and what's value. And so... Uh, so, of course, I come from the, the world of cryptography and zero knowledge proofs and from the world of scaling through zero ZK, ZK rollups. And what I want to see, of course, is one day see Starks on Bitcoin and allow them to bring that all this, this development to a smart contract and an, applica an application that we see on the rest of the, of the industry happening at the corest and most in a significant uh, piece of tech that we have. And we see that starting, like, you know, the arrival of the United Proof through Zero Sync, as I said, uh, that Robin has started building. And the fact that we can build, basically turn Mina without protocol, Bitcoin into a succinct thing that I can verify on my phone without having to download and, be, and synchronize Bitcoin Core for, for 48 hours, I think is groundbreaking. And then when we will be able to use that to make exchanges that cannot be hacked, or that they're not centralized and custodial, that I think we're going to have a massive unlock of what in Bitcoin enabled and what, um, what we're going to do. And uh, funny enough, uh, at least at Starkware, we believe that just having OP cat would be enough to do that. So this is sort of like where my, my interest is at the moment. Amazing. Love it. Super. I choose to work on Bitcoin because I think it was the best money in the world. Uh, 
Satoshi chose the right set of consensus parameters to make something that, that can actually work. And, uh, and so I choose to, to choose to work on something that actually has a chance of working. Um, as for the Bitcoin renaissance, I mostly think that it's, the, it's uh, around because there's a lot of uh, opportunities to scam people, and that attracts a lot of capital. Uh, so there's a lot of scammers in this space who are trying to uh, trying to do that, trying to get everyone's money. And uh, be aware, be aware, folks. Amidst all the uh, new exciting developments, uh, people are out there trying to take your money. Thank you for that. Um, Matt, why Bitcoin? And what's the Bitcoin renaissance to you? Yeah, sure. Um, so I got deplatformed by PayPal in 2013, and I've been really pissed since. That's why I'm building on Bitcoin. Um, I love the... I mean... We're all here for a lot of the same reasons around Bitcoin, the asset. But for me, I also want to see permissionless finance. I tried to get a uh, mortgage for my house back in 2019. Um, I wanted to put up Bitcoin as collateral. I was told to go to a specific lender, and the lender told me to sell it. And that we wouldn't talk about it again, and they'd give me my mortgage. And I don't think you should feel like a criminal. Um, use your Bitcoin as collateral. The hardest money deserves you know, all of the other retail banking uh, that you can get centrally. So that's my interest in building on Bitcoin is expanding to do all the retail finance stuff uh, now that we're, we're making some serious progress knocking out our central bankers. And then as far as the Bitcoin renaissance, um, I mean, I have to agree with, with, with Super. A lot of what's happening right now is Ordinal's got market interest. Like Ordinal's was not to me technically interesting, but from a user behavior perspective, it was very interesting. So now you see all these people who are like, oh, we can actually do things on Bitcoin and it does get a premium because it's Bitcoin. So, yeah, I think the Bitcoin renaissance is, is like, duh, of course you can build on Bitcoin. Um, the difference now is that I think users are a little bit more open uh, than they have been in the past in trying new things. And uh, I think it's for us to make sure that we don't eat our own young and call every new thing a scam, um, but also be really skeptical and make sure that uh, this time it's it's a little bit different than the experience you just get on Ethereum or some of these other chains. Awesome. Alpin? So from uh, my perspective, um, I would echo the previous sentiments about you know, I, I choose to work on Bitcoin because I think Bitcoin is the best money. I, I wrote a blog post why I focus on Bitcoin. If people want to read my long form thoughts about that. Um, and with regards to the Bitcoin renaissance, I think it's a combination of, of technological and cultural breakthroughs. Um, we had things like Taproot that um, lifted the amount of data that you could fit within a standard Bitcoin transaction. Um, we also there's you know interesting things that you can do with TapScript, um, and then there's also breakthroughs in verifiable computing, zero knowledge proofs, um, which have led to advancements in other ecosystems like uh, zk rollups or 16th blockchains, um, and I think bringing these things together um, is going to enable a lot of um, really valuable applications on Bitcoin that can allow Bitcoin to scale to support more users in a self-custodial way while remaining decentralized and also enabling new types of applications that we couldn't do with uh, Bitcoin script as it exists today. So I'm excited to see, um, see what happens at, at that kind of uh, convergence. Super cool. Um, well, I think uh, kind of building on this, uh, on, on Super and Matt's point a little bit, I think it's important to, you know, talk about trust assumptions. Um, so kind of for the projects that you're working on, um, I'd be curious if you could kind of outline, you know, user deposits Bitcoin or has assets in your off-chain project, kind of what trust assumptions um, are they making now? Um, and obviously, you know, Lalo Exit is a really important um, buzzword i've been tweeting about it other people have been tweeting about it um any thoughts on that as well and that can just be kind of open discussion um i don't know if we want to go in a specific order just unmute if you feel passionately one of the things that i'm most excited or that i most appreciate with, Light, with the lightning network is that it found a way 
to do, you know, a layer two where everybody, every user has a unilateral you know, exit unless they're using a custodian. Um, and I really think that's the, that, that's very meaningful to me. It's like, so, so I try to imitate that in most of my projects and make sure that you can still do that in everything. Love it. Um, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to go in a different direction, like the opposite, and I'm, I'm okay with, a, with being a potential cry here. Um, I'm not worried about unilateral exit, and I, and I say that in two ways. Um, as an engineer, I'm deeply, deeply, deeply worried about unilateral exit, and it keeps me up at night, and I think this is crazy important and something the Lightning has over most of these new projects. Um, that I don't know should even be called uh, L2s. So that's one. But on the other side, uh, as a person who ships products, um, I think that we need to prove that uh, Bitcoin users w want to use L2s. And I think that's more important than um, the various like security properties that we're going to come up with. So obviously, I think that um, I would prefer something as trust minimized as possible. Uh, but the truth is, like, I, I don't think that we should be pushing for new opcodes. Um, I think that I don't know that uh, it's a great idea to start a company that's predicated on changing the Bitcoin networks L1. I think that that's kind of dangerous in the past that's gone horribly wrong. And so the, for the trade-offs for me, um, I'm happier to make some sort of relaxed security assumption and then see if users actually want the stuff we're building. And once we've seen that, then consider, okay, how can we make this work on Bitcoin L1? Now, I'm very excited about BitVM. Um, it's not production ready. Um, I'm very, very, very excited about the ZKP work, especially um, all the sort of like <clears throat> zero sync stuff, which, you know, is by the same team uh, that Robin's been leading. But I think that right now it's like, well, let's show people that there's even interest in using a blockchain that isn't Bitcoin, and that uses some of Bitcoin's properties, namely the gas, the, the fees, all need to be Bitcoin. The value should accrue to Bitcoin. And let's prove that users care about that. Because then I think you have a really, really compelling argument um, for my, why we want, might want OPCAD or, or uh, OPCTB or some of these other things. So that's kind of my take. is like unilateral exit is very important. But if there's no one who's exiting, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and that's the most important thing. Got it. Spicy indeed. Um, I would love to interact later on this on this take. I, I think uh, that I exist is unrealistic in the world of 8 billion people, but we can discuss uh, how we can solve this. Well, I think, you know, yeah, kind of now is the time. Um, what kind of, what do you think about the trust assumptions that Matt just said? So, so what I would argue that, you know, in our case, this is less important than for ability to make sure that my transaction gets included, like so and don't be censorship, and that's you don't actually have to have. You know, mystic rollout, or you can also argue that the ability for anyone to pick up at a realistic hardware requirement is also something sure. that makes it enough, as long as you have forced transaction, of course. I mean, I, look, I, I, I pref like if I can choose between validity proofs and, and optimistic, like a, like a fraud proof period, I'm always going to choo choose validity proofs. But we haven't seen a ZK roll up win in the market yet on any ecosystem over an optimistic roll up. And I just think that um, we also haven't seen a chain that uses Bitcoin as its base asset, except for the Bitcoin L1, uh, with a lot of success. And so I just think that, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree. I think, I think ZK can make a lot of this better. And even if it's short of unilateral asset, or excuse me, unilateral exit, uh, there's a lot we can do. And, and uh, so I think we tend to agree. I, I would argue on the opposite, though, when it comes to, you said there is no rollout, ZK rollout that actually got PMF compared to in the versus optimistic rollout. I would argue that's actually not true. Lay it on me. In the, we've seen DYD, the DYDX, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, we heard in the context of perps. Yeah, great. Yeah, context of perps, like we've seen DYDX, ah, that's and uh, after that, Apex, 
like we seen it. The, the problem is there is to me. I mean, the, that, the adoption of ZK Rep right now. First of all, the the the, the fact that those network being production ready are very new. I mean, Starknet start only like in the last couple of months to be production ready. ZK Sync as I think the same state of development, and also there is um, there, there is a broader premium to being the first, which we've seen with Bayes and Optimism. So. And I would even argue that Optimism not having fraud proof in any capacity no, it doesn't. is just to prove that being first to market was like the reason why they've been successful. Yep. I mean, yeah. So far. Uh, curious if we can, I mean, I know Light and um, Sims, if you're uh, here, um, you guys are working on zero dollars proofs and ZK stuff at Alpha. And any thoughts on kind of Louis' take? Yes. Yeah. The. Um the layer, if you want to call it that, uh, that that Alpen is building is a it's a bit VM like system, optimized for snark verification. Um, so it's ultimately relying on the uh, optimistic kind of one of n trust model that bit VM programs are secured by, um, but using snarks uh, to make the um, verification of the programs more more efficient between the participants and so from a pragmatic perspective it's it's more of like a, a cost savings mechanism as opposed to what you see in other ecosystems where ZK snarks are um, kind of adding to the security of the roll-up um, but on the user side of you know your your average user um, interacting with the system, the snarks can also be used for uh, trust trustless or trust minimized, depending on which kind of proof system you use. Um, uh, verification of transactions on the network, so you don't have to run a full node and re-execute all the transactions yourself. You can um, sync your balances and get a snark proof that the balance is correct. Um, and and so I think you know this is this is one of the ways that we're getting zk in into Bitcoin or into the hands of Bitcoiners, so to say, without having to do a soft uh, fork or any other kind of consensus changes. And I'm uh, I'm looking forward to you know seeing how people are able to to utilize this to improve the user experience and and security. Um, for end users and uh, scale Bitcoin in a way that's better than what's possible with um, centralized custodians or other you know existing custodial models. Got it. Very interesting. Um, super. Thank you for uh, raising your hand. One of the reasons why uh, self custodial um, you know unilateral exit type stuff is very important to me is because I think it extends the option of self-sovereignty to more people. Uh, I'm able and willing to use pretty complicated systems uh, in order to ensure... Uh-oh. Super, we just lost you for a second. There we go. Oh, my phone, my phone accidentally hit the microphone button. Sorry. You're good. Um, I'm willing and able to use um, pretty advanced, difficult to use systems in order to ensure that I'm self-sovereign and have full control over my money that no one has a privileged position over me where they can steal from me or um, uh, pressure me into, into giving up and into, just paying them fees and stuff like that. Um, so I, I like systems that build on that because then you have more options. You, you, you make it so that more and more people can, can do that too if they want to. And yet you can still, you know, if they don't want that, they can still have, you can still just have someone else run the software for them and then they can, you know, be a customer of that person. Um, so I, I just I just like options. I like giving everyone um, the most the most set, the biggest set of options so that you can choose from it and they make the pick that's right for them. And if you only build custodial systems or you only build federated systems, then um, then I think it's 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 more restrictive. People then don't have the option if they want to interact with that to you know run it themselves. Got it. Love that. Let's see. Roast beef. Can you? Are you actually a speaker? Uh, I think so. Can, can you hear me? Cool. Yeah, I can hear you. 
Okay, this finally worked. <laughs> We've been battling the spaces in the background to try to <laughs> make this work effectively. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that, like, uh, you know, I don't really agree, I think, with, uh, you know, many of Matt's statements, basically. Like, uh, you know, in my opinion, like, I think, like, you know, as, as duty as, like, software developers or even people making applications are actually holding people's money, like, you sort of, like, owe them that guarantee that they can actually get their funds out, right? Because no one wants to be, wants to deal with, like, a situation where, like, you know, there's actually maybe, like, you know, legal threats or people are actually losing money left and right, basically, because, you know, someone, individuals try to, like, ship to market a little bit sooner than otherwise actually having all the same precautions in place. It may have worked for some other players in place, uh, you know, or, or, or players in the space, as is right now, but, like, I think that's a very dangerous just attitude to have, basically, of sort of, like, just, like, launch it out there and see what happens. And, like, we've seen this play out over and over and over again. I, I think. I, I, I think, think that's a little I think unfair. People, I think people are desensitized to just, well, you know how bad I, I it think, actually is. I think it's a little <laughs> it's, unfair. It's over bad. the past over the past five years, I've built a federated system that hasn't been hacked and has had seven and a half thousand BTC go through it safely. There, no, there, there are so, a lot like, of I just want to be clear. I, I, I mean, I'm well, not saying that calling that's unilateral right. exit the difference between that, that like that's not that's 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 a false dichotomy. You don't need to paint me into this corner. With like well, someone well, who's launching a shitcoin on Ethereum, or someone who's no, no, doing no, something quickly that's a cash grab. You just know? to be clear, just, just to be clear, I'm not. So I, I think the first thing that kind of I, agree, I disagree with is that like just because everyone in the world can't do it, we shouldn't try to make it possible for some people, the people that actually opt into the software, and the people that are sort of trusting you to put their funds into the software itself, right? So I, I totally understand you know technical limitations and, and so forth things like that. So I think the important thing is at least to be very very you know direct and honest with the users as far as the capabilities. Versus yeah. maybe being very vague or obfuscating kind of what's going on, or and if, you, if you say we're still figuring out, that's cool, right? But to me, I think it's something that like people must strive for, right? And we shouldn't sort of like get into this, you know, sort of like pattern where the standards are progressively being lowered over and over yeah, again just yeah. because uh, everyone agree. else is doing it. So it's cool. Let's just kind of like throw our money into this multi sig, and then people get hacked, things like that, right? So I'm saying like we should strive for something that's like greater. And I think also, you know, as people are talking about here, it is possible to like, you know, actually use some new technologies to start for that, like, you know, having like direct stock folks on the grid itself. I gave a talk at, uh, you know, Starkware's conference uh, last year about some of the stuff itself. And I think and these are things in the direction of things like ZeroSync. And in particular, uh, you know, just applying Starks to Bitcoin as is actually really, you know, uh, directly in increases the design space of things like Tapper Asset, but based on this like sort of like client side client type validated model, because if you can give me a Merkle proof, you know, in a ZK uh, proof itself, I can do a lot of things on top of that. And that's something that we're very excited about, you know, like not moving forward here on um, that side of things. So I just want to say this, like, I feel like this is one of those things where I think, you know, you sort of must be kind of uncompromising on what the thing does and uncompromising to basically yeah. get to, you know, the fact that we're possible. so uncompromising means that the best Bitcoin stuff that's been built has been a centralized exchange. you're saying here, and to some extent, I think, I understand where Matt is coming from, and I tend to agree, and um, that we don't, we should not add things to the protocol that are unnecessary. But in the context of, like, you know, um, like I'm going to, like, I, I need a start where we believe that OpenCat is enough to basically get stocks uh, into Bitcoin. That's as simple as that. You can get a lot of things from OpenCat, and um, the the problem is to how do you get acceptance into that opcode? If the Bitcoin community is not willing to look at anything coming from outside, let's say, imagine, let's say, Dogecoin or Litecoin, or, and at the same time saying, oh, but you have to show me success. So this is where, in the context of a cat, which is like a very simple opcode, we all agree, can agree on that. I do tend, I mean, I hope for that we can get consensus that this can get in, because the unlock would be just massive. And we're not talking only proof, we're talking about Lamport signatures, we need a lot of use case that would be unlocked and make the system much more reliable in the long term, in my, I mean, from my perspective, at least, from a technical perspective. Look, I, look, I, I agree with both of you. I guess I just think the market's not going to wait. That doesn't mean shipping software that's intentionally less secure. That's ridiculous. It does mean that we need to break this dilemma that Louis just explained, and we need to be like, okay, well, if we don't want to move fast and break things, obviously that's ridiculous. This is a, a multi, this is a trillion dollar economy. It's going to go bigger. Then we need to have a, a relaxation somewhere so we can see if people even want us to build other stuff. And, um, and I think we have some evidence that they do, but, uh, but the best way to get proof of that is, is by getting users. Yeah. Very interesting, you know, differing perspectives. That's why we're having this conversation. I wonder, um, Sims, we had some struggle getting you, uh, back up as speaker, do you have thoughts you want to chime in with um, if you're able to talk? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, the, I actually had some thoughts right before I was, uh, I was kicked out here uh, on 
uh, the first question that you had, like what is you know Bitcoin Renaissance and and what is this kind of new era of Bitcoin development? Um, so I, I agree. I mean, on on why you know build on Bitcoin, I think you know echo basically what a, what a bunch of other speakers here said, talking about Bitcoin as as, as the best money. But uh, I think that the thing here to also point out is how Bitcoin was designed, um, and it was designed uh, with uh, you know the idea of building in layers in mind, um, and you know it was designed with simplicity at the base layer in mind. What that means is we're not going to overload uh, Bitcoin uh, with uh, you know all, all sorts of uh, like the, the surface area of attack on Bitcoin will be low because. You know, we're not going to have, uh, you know, a m very expressive programmability, uh, but also, uh, you know, design Bitcoin to be decentralized and this peer-to-peer -peer consensus system. And I think Bitcoin being designed in simplicity um, actually really sets the stage for uh, the Bitcoin renaissance, which is, you know, as other technologies are catching up, like verifiable computation, uh, zero knowledge proofs, you know, other, other kinds of uh, uh, really in interesting technologies that have... Uh, evolved over the last decade, um, we can build new kinds of, uh, you know, new kinds of scaling uh, stages or scaling solutions or layer twos, whatever you want to call it, uh, on Bitcoin that uh, allow us to do more, right? So Bitcoin as, as a base layer is constrained, as we all know, so uh, how do we get smart contracts? I think that would actually be really interesting because, as uh, agreed with Matt, there's, there's, there's real demand for uh, a Bitcoin-based economy, and to, to be able to scale that in a sovereign way, uh, you know, the Bitcoin system is designed to, to to do that in stages. And I think we're we're sort of at this point where a lot of other technologies and innovations like BitVM and and uh, uh, and uh, these ideas are sort of in place, and and we're just uh, seeing all sorts of new uh, stages, layer twos that, that uh, weren't possible before that, that are about to come. Great, great insights. Thank you, Sims, uh, and welcome back. Um, yeah, Willem, thank you for raising your hand. I was definitely going to call on you next as, you know, somebody who is, you know, on testnet and maybe, I don't know, shipping, you know, mainnet soon TM. Um, kind of your thoughts on the latest little discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was a very interesting discussion. Um, there's all about unilateral exit. Um, I think there's a few properties that matter a lot. I think one is unilateral exit. I think second is uh, decentralization. And actually, from our perspective, we're decentralization maxis, so to speak, in the sense that we put that way higher than unilateral exit. I think if you have a, a roll-up or a more central party running the show, then unilateral exit is super important. Then censorship resistance is super important. We follow a little bit of a different thesis where we see... Uh, we, we see uh, the layer twos as being decentralized. Um, actually, we always say, we believe Bitcoin on the base layer should be absolutely decentralized where every person in the world can can run it. Um, but we as Botanics want to make a, a second layer where every company in the world can run it, more like an Ethereum. And we're working towards something that can be as decentralized as an Ethereum itself. So less decentralized as, as Bitcoin, um, but still, uh, decentralized, which immediately gives uh, censorship resistance, etc. Um, so I think uh, unilateral exit is extremely important um, for uh, for more centralized parties. Um, I think uh, for us, we we focus uh, we focus uh, on uh, on the decentralization part. I think what's also maybe important is uh, your original question about trade offs. I think every design has an interesting different set of trade offs, and it's actually exactly where we should work towards. Like some are more centralized, but higher throughput. Some are extremely decentralized with full self-sovereignty. And I can slowly actually see, see a world coming together where each application finds find their niche. Actually, um, I wanted to, to mention earlier, uh, I just saw someone, I think uh, um, he's in the audience here, but they are here, actually built a Botanics Lightning integration where you can pay Lightning invoices uh, using uh, Botanics Bitcoin, uh, which I think is incredible. Um, there's some aspects on, in Lightning, like fast free payments that you won't get uh, with any of the other uh, layer tools. And so I can see a world uh, coming where everyone has different trade-offs in, uh, in terms of design. Yeah, those were some of my thoughts. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I think the... 
I was talking with uh, the developer that you mentioned um, just earlier this morning, um, and super cool project um, from Diahar. Um, really exciting to see kind of the integration of these new projects with kind of you know the existing Lightning network um, and kind of leveraging the network effects of all the wallets and exchanges and et cetera entities on the network uh, already. So I think kind of the next sort of question that we wanted to chat about a little bit was use cases, right? Um, in these this new era with these new um, you know environments for users uh, off chain, what are the use cases that you're expecting for um, both kind of developers and users uh, to be building on your projects? I don't know if we want to start with Matt. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, mostly what I'm interested in exploring is stuff that uh, like doesn't make as much sense on Lightning, right? So I think we already have a, a great layer on Bitcoin for payments, and, I, and then soon we'll have a great layer on Bitcoin for, for payments for stable coins and whatnot as well. Um, so we're, we're focused on things that require um, like a more global consensus, or just like more parties. Um, my the two things that I care the most about are getting uh, getting a liquid stablecoin that's ideally not a fiat stablecoin uh, against my BTC, and uh, and then take the other side of that trade and actually earning uh, native yield or, or honest yield on Bitcoin. Um, I think that like ultimately I want to see twenty five percent. Like our, our mission is to see twenty five percent of the world's economy run on Bitcoin, but. <laughs> You know, I, I think that um, people don't want to spend it. Like that's that's the, that's kind of been the whole um, my whole learning in my career is people don't want to spend Bitcoin. That makes sense. You, you want to spend your your crappy paper money and, and you want to keep your Bitcoin. So I think making it really easy for someone to permissionlessly get um, something that looks like USD and acts like USD against their Bitcoin uh, and then spend that is really important. And then I think the other part that um, that we care about, which I imagine is, is, is pretty different from a lot of other folks, is just like, I, I want to see really tight integration with CFI because there's, there's too much Bitcoin on people's balance sheets right now. Like talking about, talking about self-custody, it, it's not safe um, to have the ETFs ha hold this much Bitcoin, to have exchanges hold this much Bitcoin. And I think that um, when I say I, I wish we would have moved faster here, what I mean is like, We've been so concerned about security models that it's kept us from solving this need, and centralized parties have kind of taken the place of um, of a proper decentralized solution. So anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say is, yeah, it, it's it's uh, I, I struggle to use the word DeFi because so much of it isn't, but I'm interested in access to stable coins, uh, primarily against your Bitcoin as collateral, and uh, simple yield. Got it. Thoughts from other folks? Yeah, super. Go ahead. Um, my primary interest in that regard is to destroy all stable coins. Uh, <laughs> I think that to the extent that uh, to the extent that people use stable coins, it's a failure of Bitcoin to um, solve some need of theirs. Uh, and I and I would like to make it so that Bitcoin solves that need. Whatever it is that they like, you know, the one thing about Bitcoin that I really want stable coins for is X. I want to solve that for them so that they don't even need stable coins or fiat for that. They can just use Bitcoin for it. Why hasn't that already been solved in the last, say, six years, you think? I, I don't know. I'm not prepared for that question. Well, I guess I'll just say it pulled. What we learned is we used to try to get people to spend Bitcoin. That was our primary thing. Um, and they didn't want to. They, they wanted to for years, and then they stopped. And the reason was because they didn't want to spend something that's going to go up. Because in a lot of tax regimes, spending Bitcoin is is uh, very expensive, and it's hard to use it as your primary money at, like of exchange, right? So I actually agree with you. I want to see stable coins die. I want to see fiat die. That's why I'm in this space. But I think it's an obvious evolution to give people a stable coin against their Bitcoin uh, to ease that friction, rather than just telling people that they should know better not to touch central banks because that's that's not realistic. That's something that takes uh, years. And, the, and is are years unrealistic? No, no, I'm here for it, man. I'm here. I'm here for the long play, but uh, I also want to serve users in the meantime, so we can grow our space faster. I I, I don't think stable coins grow our space. I think it grows their space. Let's have Blue chime in. 
I, I mean, so I just want to to interact a tiny bit with the uh, uh, testnet comment. Um, look, I'm like no one here. I think think highly of that, but. I did work extensively with uh, Nigerian and Kenyan devs, and the reason why they care so much about crypto in all realistic manners is not so much because of the ability to own hard money, it's for them to ability to access... Oh, shit, I'm lost. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Sorry, hi. We, we yeah, fine. because I think I lost... Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I was saying that... Uh, I'm going to start from scratch, but apparently, yeah, I lost a bit of, uh, of time. Um, so... I worked extensively with Nigerian and Kenyan dev and actually from Congo, Uganda and stuff. And when you ask them, all of them, the reason why they care so much about crypto is not so much the ability to access harmony because they just don't have access to harmony anyway. And for them to be able to access the, at least to some extent, the money of the hardest economy, aka the dollars. And we like it or not, that's what they need it for. They need to be going to be paid by international companies. They need to be paid by, you know, whatever company wants to hire a remote worker because they just can't have access to a bank account. And so while we will get there through Bitcoin, I think that the most interesting thing is that at least make them be able to accept, change that, that currency, that, 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 that the dollar that they want in the wallet, into something harder. And so this is, to me, the way we are bringing Bitcoin use cases is just enabling them to their use cases and just bring them there. It sounds like they want into a system that I'm trying to get out of. I don't know what the best solution no, is. No, we're there, just trying to offer they can, they, can, they can have all my U.S. dollars and I'll, and I'll take Bitcoins instead. But, but that, that's, that's easy to... I mean, sorry, I, I don't know you as a super, but uh, it's easy. It's an easy position to have. I'm, I don't know where you're coming from. If you can, they're going to do that. And, you know, I'm going to tell you... Like, uh, here's a story. Um, so there is a dev on, on the, in the, in the micro system. Uh, I will name it in Kenya. And this guy... Um, uh, basically, the we see, like we, we pay him through crypto, through dollars, because he needs it. And because of all the payment we were able to give him, what now he's able to buy a house at 22 in his country. I think that's life changing for him. And discarding his wants is is coming from a place of uh, of uh, understanding their need. So what I'm trying to say, I'm not blaming you. I perfectly understand where you're coming from, but. It's, it's, it's a different perspective. They have what they need. And we can help them get the hardest type of money, but they need first to be able to access them the routes to access it in the first place. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the, the history of my uh, interactions with the U.S. dollar system is a history of broken trust, of people taking my money without my consent, of account closures, of inability to pay. And whereas my experience in the world of Bitcoin is the complete opposite, it's complete freedom of self sovereignty, of, of me having full control over my money and, and no one ever be able to say no to me. I, I suspect that my experience is a lot different from someone in South Africa or, or wherever the people you're dealing with are. Uh, and perhaps what, what I've experienced is perhaps when I've dealt with the fiat system, it is not so bad, you know, in comparison. Maybe they're like, we would, we would give our left leg to have whatever, what you had before. But, um, yeah, I, I want something better. So that's where that's where I'm at. So super, I would love to. There is the conference happening on the 11th of May in Lagos. If you want to join, I'd be happy to invite you. I, I think I'll be there, so I'd be happy to invite you so you can meet them. Sure, let's do it. Yeah, I think I think we definitely all want something better. Uh, and you know, and speaking of that, uh, Alpen Team, Sims, and Light, I'm really curious for kind of what sort of use cases you all are building towards and foreseeing um, on your solutions. Yeah, I, I have one in mind, and then like um, I'm sure you have use cases in mind as well. Um, I mean, I, for me, it's like the you know, like banking, but but done totally you know differently than than banks work today, where uh, uh, you know the, the key part actually here is accessibility for 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 the world, right? And so, what does that mean? It's you know like the, the UX needs to be there uh, to be accessible for the world. Like you know, you can't fat finger or something. Uh, you want you know self custody that uh, that delivers to to, to the world. Uh, you want uh, payments uh, that are possible uh, through your banking app. You know, uh, at low cost, at scale. Um, and you know, most people would want you know instant you know payments uh, that are cheap and 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 this should be scalable as well with high throughput. 
Um, so building both the UX and the, the, the kind of scale that's necessary uh, to do, you know, banking where I can kind of hold uh, my asset, my, you know, I can hold Bitcoin, uh, I can have different accounts where maybe I can take uh, an earn interest um, uh, th through the money, uh, like that's, that's really interesting to me. And I think broadly <clears throat> opening up the, the innovation, uh, you know, so that, you know, just, just like the web, it's, it's really hard to predict exactly what kinds of applications uh, were actually built out, but because this was programmable, you know, composable protocols, and, and people were building uh, sort of, you know, w with each other, like the, the kinds of applications, the kinds of utility and access uh, that were possible, uh, you know, it's, it's just really hard to imagine that at the beginning. And so I think the same thing will happen here when, when you have more programmability. <clears throat> and uh, and that's what I'm excited about. I think the banking application for sure, but sort of even the, the applications that, 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 are, that are harder to imagine today, um, I think that's exciting to... Uh, to see play out as well. Yeah, to follow on from that, um, one of the exciting things about this Bitcoin renaissance and the new, um, the new protocols, the new layers people are, are building on Bitcoin is the, the new level of freedom that people are getting to experiment with the different kinds of execution environments, different kinds of applications that they can build in those environments. Um, and and really seeing that developer creativity flourish on Bitcoin, um, specific you know end user facing applications that are interesting to me, um, definitely you know Bitcoin based finance as uh, Sims was saying, um, and also looking at um, like scaling uh, and Bitcoin payments and improving um, the privacy of Bitcoin payments. As well, um, and potentially, you know, even like extending that those privacy improvements to existing layers uh, such as the Lightning Network. Um, so, you know, by by having um, a more um, expressive uh, kind of programming environment, um, we can use technology like zero knowledge proofs to add um, on chain privacy and and uh, extend that privacy to different applications, um, whether it's applications built directly on the chain or off-chain protocols like Lightning. Um, so you, users can have more privacy when they're doing their on-chain um, Lightning you know, management operations. So um, yeah, like being able to add privacy and, and improve scalability and bring down costs for using Bitcoin in a self-custodial or, or, or at least you know, as close to self-custodial as possible kind of way is um, really exciting to me. Super cool. Awesome. Um, well, thank you all. Really appreciate it. Uh, I think uh, another topic that's been, you know, hot, uh, especially over the last few days has been kind of BitVM and the BitVM evolution. Um, so I wonder, Super, if you could, if we could call on you just to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, how the project has evolved, kind of what your current, um, you know, views on it are. Uh, and then I know others have been looking into BitVM generally uh, and can chime in on their perspectives as well. When Robin Linus proposed um, BitVM, uh, I got really, really excited because we'd been, me and him and, and another guy named Sam Parker, who'd been trying to do something like it for a really long time. Uh, and so as soon as he showed me um, like the idea, I rushed to make an implementation right away. Uh, and I released something horrible. <laughs> I released something that matches exactly the, uh, the naive implementation idea he suggested in the white paper as like, you know, you could do this, but it would be very inefficient. Never do this. I was like, that's what I'm going to make. Uh, so I release something that, that you know works, that it can do computation, but super inefficiently and is and this horrifying to look at. Um, and then Robin, who's a much better programmer than I am, just put together a team of people from this existing bit zero sync to make something better, and that's bit VM one. Um, and uh, they, in the midst of making bit VM one, they were writing it in JavaScript with an intention to port it to Rust, and then found that JavaScript wasn't up to the task of what they were trying to make it do. So they kind of abandoned um, their work on BitVM1 and uh, started rewriting it in Rust. And then he came up with BitVM2, which is um, an improvement to the design of the bridging construction he wants to make to go from Bitcoin to a second layer. 
that improves it from requiring one of n people to be honest to, uh, to, to make it so that anyone can issue a challenge. Uh, anyone can issue a challenge if they think that like a block was processed invalidly on a on the side chain or, or a withdrawal wasn't processed. Uh, and I actually haven't read the BitDM2 proposal, um, so I'm not quite sure how it works. But um, yeah, I think that's a that's a pretty cool improvement if if, it, if he's correct. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, but that's where we're currently at. Is uh, I think he's he's retool he's abandoned now the work he has done on making BitVM1 in Rust, and now he's working on making BitVM2. Uh, meanwhile, the, my original implementation, the one that sucks, that's still the only one that actually works right now. So everything else is just theory, theory right now. I've got the only implementation of BitVM that actually runs and you know gives you valid transactions. So yeah, that's uh, that's where we're at, and uh, I hope things continue to get better. Very cool. Um, and just, uh, I wonder, like, before we, we open it up to the rest of folks who I'm sure have thoughts on this, um, could you talk a little bit about kind of the recent uh, back and forth regarding liquidity and kind of like the, you know, thundering herd exit problem? Yes, and uh, Tyler uh, Riddle and Eric Wall um, and Rindale uh, know more about this than I do. So if any of them, I think some of them are in the audience. If, if you guys would consider giving them a speakership, that would be great. Um, but uh, th recently they wrote an article where they analyzed some of the documentation, I think from the Citria team, about how they are planning to do a Bitcoin um, L2 using BitVM, and uh, found that there was a, in one of the circumstances with the, with the current, or with BitVM1's model, um, if, the, if the person who's processing withdrawals can't do, can't do one, uh, he's supposed to lose the access to user funds. Um, they're supposed to. They're, he's supposed to be a second that can be ejected from the multisig. Uh, there's like an N of N multisig where he's one of the people, and he's supposed to be ejected from it. I think that the Tyler uh, and Rindale group uh, misinterpreted that, or uh, if they want to correct me, that and I, I would welcome your correction. I think they misinterpreted that to say the funds get burned rather than just the bridge operator can't can't access the funds anymore because he's ejected from the multisig. But. Um, uh, but they, they they wrote a paper about how if user funds get burned in this way, then you know they can never they can never be accessed again. Uh, and that's just, that's just it, it wasn't accurate. It's just that that bridge operator who said he could process the withdrawal and then could not um, gets ejected, and uh, and then the remaining people who are who are honest, hope, you know, hopefully, are able to um, uh, continue it from that point. At least that's how it was under BitVM one. Uh, it might have changed under BitVM2, but um, again, I can't really comment on that because I haven't read it yet. Um, but uh, I hope that clarifies something. It probably doesn't. It probably just makes it even more confusing. <laughs> but, uh, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, the rest of the folks who I, I know have been you know, generally looking into BitVM have kind of thoughts, comments, concerns. Um, I, so I, I actually did uh, study quite extensively in uh, BitVM2. Uh, so I may be able to talk about it. Um, so the way BDM2 works is, so uh, I mean, uh, similar to BDM1, there is a flow-proof mechanism. And the way you, uh, the way it works, okay, so I'm, I, I, I'm afraid to misquote, so I'm just gonna know if Robin, I think Robin's in the audience, if you come. Um, so the way you start is by creating a, a, a multisig of NN, which is basically a covenant. The reason why you want this trust the setup is because you, there is no way to commit uh, to money uh, to various scenario in Bitcoin um, in, in a way that you can, yeah, you, I'm committing now and I'm predefining the way you're going to spend them afterwards. And then the operator is going to get that money in the end as long as he operates correctly. And super interesting model that can basically is trying to mimic covenants using this multisig. It's, it's not, this, this multisig is the right word, it's a, it's a setup. Uh, where uh, similar to like if you want the the Zcash setup, where no one can steal the money unless if one of those guys just burned the key, um, it's a very interesting model. It's the probably the best you can do under the current like, specification of Bitcoin. Um, it has a of committing ahead of time and. Uh, and having to rerun the operation every n time, and there is another question about uh, actually there is an evolution, so I don't want to miss uh, to to misrepresent. 
which kind of removes the liquidity requirement uh, because it sort of removes the incentive of the of the operator to steal to to steal the money because he's getting nothing out of it. But there is some griefing attack to it. I will not dive too much there because uh, Robin did a much better explanation. Regardless of anything, it's a super interesting work. It's the best probably we can do under the current scope of what Bitcoin offers. And I know Robin would love to get like, you know, a bit more expressivity to make it a lot better. Got it. I think it might help to, to outline how withdrawals are supposed to be processed um, on, on the BitVM. So let's suppose that you put, you know, 10 Bitcoins on, um, on, an L, on a BitVM based L2. And like, you know, you're doing trading or you're buying ordinals or whatever it is you want to do on, a, on the L2. And three weeks later, you decide you want to exit. You're, you're done with, you, you want to take five of your Bitcoins and, and leave with those. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to create a transaction on the L2 that says, here are my here's proof that I have five Bitcoins. Um, I'm currently destroying them. I no longer have these five Bitcoins on the L2. And it starts like a timer where the, 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 the bridge, the, the, the multi-sig that actually has all the user funds, it has a certain amount of time to send you five Bitcoins on Bitcoin. You've earned them on the L2, and you're supposed to get that amount out on L1. And the emojis that can do this because they have all user funds. All user funds are deposited into an N of N you know, multi-sig. Um, how it's supposed to happen is that one of the members of the multi-sig, who's uh, called a bridge operator, is supposed to send you your five bitcoins and then get reimbursed um, from, the, from the members of the, of the two of two. Uh, from the members of the N of N, I mean. Uh, and if he doesn't send you the, the, amount, uh, the five bitcoins in time, then uh, any of the N of N members can challenge him and say you didn't you didn't do it, and we're going to take um, so we're, we're going to burn some of your some of your stake and eject you from the multi stake. You you weren't honest. You said you would forward user funds to users to withdraw. You didn't. So we destroy some of your money as penalty, and then we eject you from the multi stake so you can never hurt anyone else again. Uh, and then one of the other people takes over, and they have to do the same thing. They have to send the five bitcoins to you or have their stake burned and then they get, you know, ejected from the multi-sig. And you keep doing that over and over again until one of two things happen. Yeah. happens. Either somebody in the multi-sig sent you your money, or you get down to the very last person and he runs off with it. Someone, you're, you're trusting that at least one person in the multi-sig can send you the money if you make a withdrawal request. Or, if, if all of them are dishonest, then the last one just, uh, he's, he's dishonest too and he just runs off with, that, with everyone's money. Um, so that's how BitVM1 was designed, and uh, the, the concern is, like, what if everyone in the L2 withdraws at the same time, you know, there's uh, 10,000 Bitcoins in there, and all 10,000 Bitcoins are tried to be withdrawn all at once, uh, but probably there's no withdrawal, no um, bridge operator can spend that money, so it definitely, well, they misinterpreted this and thought that it just meant user funds get burned. But it would get down to a situation where you have to trust the last guy. At least the last guy will have all the, all the user funds in a one of one, because there's no N of N left, everyone's been ejected. And then you have to trust that at least he is honest. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of the situation. Uh, I hope that helps clarify what the concern is. I, I have quick thoughts, Ryan, uh, for time here yeah, on, on, on BitVM. Uh, so uh, on BitVM uh, 2, uh, we're excited about that, uh, and uh, you know, I, I just the, the caveat there is uh, there is a big sort of research overhead uh, to, to be able to like really build this out, um, and in particular, the challenge is sort of taking a snark verification uh, that that program, something like a Groth 16 verifier or a Flonk verifier, something like that, uh, and actually implementing it uh, in script in Bitcoin script. Uh, the, the concept is, I mean, of course, we would take, this would be a very long script, um, even though the Groth 16 verification, that algorithm is you know, relatively straightforward, but it's with the limits that we have with Bitcoin script, it ends up being really, really long. So the first step is even implementing that in script. And uh, the second step is, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's really to get that implementation down to a reasonable enough size where we'd be able to break those uh, you know, that into segments of implementation so we could take chunks of, you know, that whole script uh, and design it in a way where uh, an operator, a bridge operator, 
would be able to uh, commit to, uh, th these are big commitments, commit to intermediate values uh, that uh, this, uh, this program would take on. So because big commitments also take, a, you know, sort of larger size in the witness to commit to, uh, this ends up actually being a, a, a big challenge. And so there's, you know, active sort of research, and uh, I, I know Robin and, and ZeroSync team and the BitPM community has uh, been on this. We've also been researching this as well on, like, how do we actually get this to be, you know, small enough? And I suspect that this will take some time, uh, but it's, you know, the implications are, are, are awesome for BitPM2, where, you know, anyone would be able to uh, challenge uh, 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 a claim that's made by an operator. So that, that that's one on BitVM2. And then the other thing is, I, I think we should generally decouple BitVM and, uh, and, and BitVM bridges. And I think that's actually what led to a lot of the confusion uh, that we saw recently too. BitVM we see as a primitive uh, for, uh, it's, it's a you know, challenge response game <clears throat> in the BitVM1 context. It's, it's uh, I guess, still kind of a, a challenge response, but not as long uh, in, in the BitVM2 sort of uh, 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 context, but it, it's primitive for verifying, uh, so, so for, for Bitcoin to be able to uh, adjudicate some claim about a fraud. Uh, and, and that's a really, really powerful primitive because it allows us to create interesting kinds of bridges that go beyond the federated, you know, uh, the, the majority multi-sig kind of assumption. Um, but we take ideas from like, you know, from ARC with connector outputs and, and sort of other uh, ideas and, and different teams have different ways of designing that bridge. Um, I know that uh, Supers uh, has, has had a, a, a really interesting uh, bridge design that, that's been put out, but it's different from the type of bridge designs that rollups uh, typically use. And I think a well-designed rollup um, can make use of the BitVM primitive and not fall to, uh, you know, a lot of the issues that were described, uh, you know, in the, in the recent uh, uh, article uh, about BitVM consider unsafe. For example, like funds don't have to be burned uh, directly. I think super called out. But also the other example around like the you know liquidity requirements. Well, um, you know you can design <clears throat> in you know with some liveness assumptions uh, cases where uh, you know the operator basically gets reimbursement, gets you know the the, the funds back uh, from the deposits uh, you know much faster. It, it's not like the, the, the six month or, or these kinds of cases of you know the withdrawal time would be like in the worst case uh, you know without liveness uh, requirements etc and that's also for uh, specifically the BitVM kind of uh, uh, risk five uh, approach I think there are more optimized versions that will probably come out uh, but uh, the the point is in, in in the happy case you can actually get reimbursements the operator can get reimbursements much faster. Um, allowing them to use uh, uh, a fixed amount uh, of, of collateral basically to cover over, you know, like a long period of time over a day, they could cover uh, uh, many, many times that collateral. So they, they wouldn't necessarily need to maintain this, this kind of, you know, one-to-one -one against the bridge uh, in, such, in such design. So it's worth, I'm clarifying that because like BitVM is a important primitive and I think on top of that, we can build different types of bridges and, and we can't sort of lump everything there in, in, into one. Got it, very interesting. Um, well, appreciate uh, the update and the discussion and definitely following kind of the VM progress with interest. Um, I don't know, JHB, if you're uh, available and listening, I know we've had some issues getting you up as a speaker. Um, not sure if you have some extra thoughts. I guess ping me on the side if you do before we move on. Um, because, you know, obviously all of us uh, are building protocols that, you know, are great in theory, but only really progress uh, if we get developer adoption. So I know, um, Willem, uh, you know, you guys have been on Testnet for a little while now. I think, you know, launched on Testnet in um, November or so. So kind of what are you seeing as far as developer adoption? Um, kind of what are developers excited about building and where they need to get started? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that was the, that was the reason for, uh, for having a testnet out in November. Um, I think the, it, it's very funny how uh, over the last few months I've talked with so many Bitcoin maxis that are founders of protocols or dApps on Ethereum. 
um, and I keep getting on calls with them and they're like, yeah, I'm actually a Bitcoin max. I'm like, what? <laughs> You're building a dApp on, uh, on Ethereum. Uh, but actually, uh, uh, what I realized is that, yeah, a lot of people, everyone started with, with Bitcoin and then I guess uh, went built somewhere else because it's extremely hard to build on Bitcoin. And now suddenly, uh, with, for example, like uh, Botanics, it's fully EVM equivalent, it becomes super easy. Uh, to start building back on Bitcoin. And so actually, uh, we see a lot of people in the, in the Ethereum space of, or people who came from Bitcoin, went to Ethereum or somewhere else, actually coming back, uh, coming back home to Bitcoin. Um, so I think the interest is uh, absolutely incredible. And yeah, I mean, super excited because when you think about it, um, Bitcoin is three times bigger market cap. And so... Uh, yeah, what, what has happened on Ethereum or has reached product market fit there or reached product market fit on Bitcoin, but just just way bigger. Um, so there's, a, yeah, massive interest. Um, super. Um, I have a question for Mr. Botanics. Do you, do you know if the Rootstock team, I think that they were, the Rootstock uh, implementation of the EVM is fully EVM compatible. Do you, can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, I might be wrong here. Maybe uh, uh, Light can uh, chime in as well, but I, I don't think it's fully compatible. I think uh, the EVM keeps updating and making changes, and so um, you need to be up to date with the uh, uh, yeah with the final implementations of the EVM. And so we are using uh, Ref or RE, uh, the Rust implementation of the EVM, which is actually a very um, recent code base and very neat, very clean actually. Um, and so that's fully up to date with the with the latest uh, changes, which I think is important because basically now you can copy paste anything that exists on on Ethereum. Um, you deploy it on Botanics, and you can use Bitcoin for everything. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my impression. I think uh, Rootstock is a little bit behind on the last changes, but I might might be wrong here. So yeah, yeah, I think you're right about that. Like, uh, to my knowledge, like, Sergio has implemented like a lot of optimizations for sort of like you know the OG VM there. Like, as far as like you know doing other things to fix parallelization things like that. So I think it's, I think it's sort of like deviated pretty far. Also, given that like you know there's a lot of hard work trying to heat. So, so I don't think they have quite a lot of compatibility than something else. I just you know forked out the mainline would. Cool. Um, is the same thing going to happen? Where like you know five years from now, someone's going to come up with some other new one and then say, you know, well, Botanics is, they, they're using a Rust implementation from 2024 and, you know, it's no longer up to date. Yeah, very good question. I think uh, this is a timeline uh, question. Like, are we always going to stay up to date, I don't know, 10 years from now? It will be very hard. Um, I think considering the design of Botanics that we can basically more or less plug and play the EVM. Um, and Armin will probably will kill me for this. Uh, but yeah, uh, we're, we are definitely uh, hoping to fully stay up to date and rebase uh, uh, constantly. For the short term, long term, of course, uh, will not be diverge. Yeah, cool. Um, how about, uh, you know, on the developer adoption question, kind of Sims, Light, um, you know, thoughts from you all on kind of what developers want and what you think, you know, adoption will look like? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, we've, we've talked to uh, a lot of developers. I think there's a lot of interest more on uh, uh, more financial applications. In particular, they, they want to use Bitcoin uh, like a, a, as a, like as a collateral for for different types of applications. Uh, they also want to create better uh, you know, custody uh, solutions uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, like because we had uh, a lot of constraints on the base layer. Uh, there's, you know, this kind of uh, angst and interest around uh, creating uh, experiences uh, for the Bitcoin asset, um, you know, from using it as a collateral to uh, kind of creating better uh, UX around uh, payments. I think there's privacy is also another another recurring one that we see, like better privacy solutions, um, which can be possible um, through uh, more programmable uh, smart contracts. And so uh, that's that's kind of, you know, we're, we're seeing it. Uh, we're also seeing interest um, around stables uh, and stable coins as well, uh, both from the, the you know the, the uh, fiat-backed stables and also uh, uh, Bitcoin collateralized stables. Uh, so I think that that will be interesting. Um, uh, yeah, um, 
that in, in terms of kind of developers, I think that's that's where we're seeing more interest. Love it. Um, and then uh, Louis on the on the Sharkware side, obviously you guys have been you know building out Cairo and developer tools generally um, for kind of working with ZK Starks um, for a while. Just kind of curious, any thoughts, insights on kind of what the developer community wants and needs, and how adoption is going and bringing them to Bitcoin. Thinks we think we just lost them right as I asked that. Um, but we're not great timing. Um, well, let me see if we can get him back. Let's see. Do we have any questions we can ask in the meantime? Uh, no, I, I, I think we have him back. Um, so Louis, uh, I just asked kind of about developer adoption uh, of Starkware's tools and, you know, what your plans are to bring him to Bitcoin. That's, a, I mean, that's a great, a great question. So, uh, Starkware adoption. Um, so we had the fastest growth of dev of all the, uh, the space, um, in the last three years, uh, two and a half years, if you look at the uh, developer report. Um, and when it comes to Bitcoin, I guess the most exciting project is obviously zero sync. Um, so I'm a bit sad that they put aside the, the, the zero sync efforts, uh, on, on, I mean, to put the zero sync effort on standby until the full focus on BGM, but, that's actually quite the other opportunity for the, for someone else who actually wants to dive into Bitcoin and and and, and use zero sync and implement a fully pretty fetched version of zero sync. And, and we were talking to Rosby before, and even having zero sync would simply a lot of design on Lightning and improve a lot of the reliability of many of the current design we are thinking about, even including BitVM. So just that uh, we do see adoption and I, the reason I'm actually part of this chat today is actually to sort of tell the, tell the people you want to do VKP then you want to do it in an efficient way carry the right tool for you and it's already available now so so uh, it's no longer like a myth that was always 10 years ahead it's actually here so yeah we're looking forward to seeing more people building using it uh, actually someone actually that's interesting someone just verify zero sync on Starknet um, the other day uh, meaning that she technically have uh, the first time that there is a new Bitcoin relayer after uh, probably like six years of interruption. So, um, so yeah, there are use cases, and I'm looking forward to see them happening. Awesome, um, great. Well, then, um, and and Willem, you had mentioned this earlier, but I think you know uh, we definitely want to close with talking a little bit about lightning interoperability. Um, so you mentioned. Um, kind of the lightning bridge uh, with Botanix uh, that's using kind of submarine swaps to swap, you know, to be able to pay a lightning invoice from funds in Botanix account. You want to just talk a little bit about why you think that's important? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was actually uh, uh, very impressed when I saw it happen. Like you basically have your MetaMask, you have uh, the Bitcoin in your MetaMask, and then you go to a lightning invoice and you can pay that directly directly from your MetaMask, which I think is, yeah, it's very incredible just from a, a tech perspective. Um, I, I personally uh, was imagining myself already paying a lightning invoice in PubKey with Botanix Bitcoin on my MetaMask. Um, that as a side, I think in general, why this is important, um, if you try to think, I don't know, 20 years from now or 100 years from now, how this world will run on Bitcoin, I think Lightning has some specific characteristics that no one else has. It's uh, fast and free payments, and I think that suits itself yeah, very easily for uh, really um, peer-to-peer and real payments in real life. I think what might happen is you keep a lot of Bitcoin in cold storage if you want to use it more in, in applications or in the financial system, you keep it on a, on a layer two on an EVM. If you want to pay um, in the stores and pay people, you basically uh, uh, use Lightning for that. Besides that, I think uh, it also showcases that that Lightning can be um, can be a bridge between different uh, between different layer twos. Um, yeah, I think it's it's um, it was always something theoretical to have an EVM interoperable with Lightning. I think seeing it for the first time happen is absolutely incredible um uh, yeah it was really cool super cool love it um sims i know we've talked about this as well um kind of lightning is the interoperability layer between these new off-chain projects any kind of thoughts from your end 
Um, I think I think Light has some some good thoughts here too. Oh, cool! Uh, if you, if you want to share, sure, sure. Yeah, in in my report, validity rollups on Bitcoin, which Louis mentioned earlier. Uh, shout out Starkware for supporting that work. Um, we have a set, actually a whole section about how um, rollups and Lightning can synergize, kind of work together to um, help kind of fill each other's gaps. So, uh, or or you know even like supercharge each other's capabilities. Um, and you know one thing that I think I kind of alluded to this earlier is is like actually you know using rollups to provide more block space for your you know on chain. Uh, transactions that are needed for lightning channel management um, but another thing you know interesting capability of lightning is actually you know like being an interoperability layer between um, rollups in the main chain or you know other chains um, whether those are Bitcoin side chains or, or other networks altogether um, and and we're kind of seeing the emergence of this. Like this isn't just you know like sci-fi or, 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 or like fanfic. This is like a, a real thing that's happening. Um, so you know, shout out to Bolts who has been building integrations between um, blockchains and and Lightning um, with Liquid. Um, I think they have Rootstock support in the works uh, as well. Um, another. Uh, innovator here is uh, a developer named Pseudozac who's built um, integrations between Lightning and Rootstock and Lightning and Stacks. Um, and so, yeah, it, you know, this, like I said earlier, this isn't just fanfic. It's like a real thing that's happening. And I think we're just going to see this uh, continue to uh, grow as, you know, people, there are more and more users who are like, you know, Bitcoin sidechain or Bitcoin layer 2, Bitcoin rollup uh, native, and but they still want to tap into the network effects and the, and the, the low cost, the fast transactions, the good UX um, that, that, you know, lightning payments um, can bring um, or, you know, just want to be able to like hop between these chains without having to go back through the L1. Lightning can provide like a trust minimized way for getting Bitcoin from one chain to another really fast um, and low cost. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's kind of uh, lines up exactly with our vision as well. Um, Lalo, I don't know if you want to chime in uh, a little bit about that, about kind of Lightning as the interoperability layer between um, different off-chain environments. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think the main contract of the HTLC is sort of like that synchronization, you know, mechanism, basically, um, you know, which lets you sort of like, uh, you know, make certain like a change in atomic. And I think this is something that you'll need, but no matter like how many of these like side chains actually exist, sort of like a way to actually, you know, do these swaps, uh, you know, reference Bitcoin. I think also like, um, you know, maybe the case that, like, you know, whatever these bridges end up looking like, you know, maybe the case that individuals actually don't always take the slow path, you know, out of the bridge. Because I think some of them are sort of like have like a some sort of like time delay, or maybe it's like a month or two or something like that itself. You know, something like Lightning can let you just, you know, go directly onto Bitcoin in a faster way. Then you can just do a swap directly onto the system uh, back and forth, right? And that requires sort of like some other provider that's helping you and like, you know, um, you know, doing search but some, something that can just be, you know, much more, uh, much faster as well too, right? And there are sort of like other like higher level ways you can sort of like layer on atomic drops. I don't know if people know, um, um, you know, Maurice Hurley, so sort of like the person that sort of like, you know, created a bunch of like uh, concurrency primitives, things like, you know, STM, things like that as well. They actually have a lot of research on this topic around sort of like, you know, sort of like progressively, uh, you know, more formalized layered versions of atomic swap, but actually also a multi-participant and uh, multi sort of like uh, entity as well. So I think that's definitely would be a cool, you know, area of research and just uh, general development, you know, assuming all this stuff starts to uh, spin up the way um, individuals think it would. How about if I can just stick with you for a second, Lalu, talking about, you know, we've talked about now lightning interoperability, how about kind of tempered assets and interoperability? We heard a lot of demand for kind of stable coins and how important stable coins are for all these sort of projects. So kind of bridging stable coins from tempered assets over, over, over to other off-chain environments, et cetera. Uh, yeah, 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 super great question. Um, so people know uh, we're working on, you know, tap assets, which is uh, sort of like a way to you know, represent, you know, assets, uh, you know, Bitcoin, sort of different than like other things where it's like, you know, it's actually like client friendly and that like I can give you sort of like a proof and you can have like a like client, everything just like works there directly. There's no need to sort of like, you know, scan the chain and index. And this lets you sort of like, you know, get away with a bunch of like, you know, uh, simpler designs basically because now at this point you can just do it on a mobile phone and it's also less trusting as well because you don't need to sort of like trust some of the third party index or something like that in order to actually, uh, you know, do these things, uh, you know, assets, right? Uh, and the way it works 
works out. You basically have like an output, and people know they have like a, we have Taproot today, uh, and you know Taproot basically has these like a Merkle tree of like scripts, right? So what we do, we, we basically have another script or something that like you know looks like a script to Bitcoin itself, but it's it actually interpreted, which is sort of like the representation you know of the asset itself, right? You can then you know as you're like you know uh, embedding that in various outputs, that's basically the way you do the different transfers, and there's a bunch of other mechanisms to do discovery and validation uh, and things like that, right? But I think what we're really, really interested in is also being able to actually you know lift this stuff onto Lightning itself. And this is like one of our big focus areas, and like we're making some pretty good progress on this. You know, like it's, it's coming soon. You know, sooner than maybe you anticipate. If you, if you guys are watching some of the LMD PRs, some of the PRs at the repo, you can see sort of like the progress in, in real time there. Uh, but that's going to be really exciting because now at this point, like, um, you know, I think maybe. Uh, I think Super said earlier that like, oh, you know, I don't necessarily like stable coins because it's about like, you sort of like bringing them, you know, bringing us to basically their domain versus the other round. But I think it's actually the opposite that like, you know, if we're able to actually do this and, you know, some of the points that we was making as well, these individuals maybe are more interested in the transactional activity because you know, for them, they don't necessarily have that like sort of like fundamental financial infrastructure. We're actually able to sort of like grow the pie entirely, right? And that like, you know, if we have more and more activity on the edges, you know, using these, uh, you know, stable coins in this type of channel itself, there actually, you know, has more uh, pressure on the light network itself to continue to to expand, to add more capital, and to increase writing fees as well. So I think there's a very like you know interesting flywheel there. There, yeah, as people are actually able to sort of like you know use Lightning and use Bitcoin, but have like a slightly different sort of like front end. You can say it. so it's sort of like you know fiat the front end, you know Bitcoin back end, right? I think this is generally good for Bitcoin because this actually means we'll have you know more and more activity on the Lightning network itself. In order to send these you know things to the edges, you basically need, because you know a Lightning is fully collateralized, you need more and more uh, you know Bitcoin onto the network itself, right? So I think that's something that's you know, super exciting. And I think generally as well, like. You know, I think this will also give people other opportunities to basically make additional applications in companies on top of Bitcoin because once you have the ability to basically do, you know, sort of like a non-custodial, you know, USD swap on top of Bitcoin itself, something that like, you know, was at Bitcoin initially and then moved, moved, moved elsewhere. And this is sort of like, you know, what actually fueled a lot of the other, you know, activity on these other chains, basically people being able to do this type of financial primitive. I think that's really exciting. I think it also just reduces the operational sort of like, uh, you know, uh, opportunity cost or even burden of like standing up something that's able to, you know, move, uh, you know, these funds back and forth. And, you know, I view it as sort of like being able to make the, the R and off ramps a little bit less steep, right? Because obviously things are hard because once you have your coin ticket, what do you do with it? I have to go to this other thing, maybe I go to Western Union, but if you can just like, you know, in your wallet, just hit something to uh, go back and forth as easily on the main chain, all fully, um, you know, like kind of compatible and verified, uh, that's, that's really exciting. And, you know, and the other, you know, uh, thread that we're, we're looking at as well is sort of integration of, you know, these various, uh, you know, ZKPs, like structure and so forth, because that also, like, just solves general, um, you know, scalability problems with this type of design, because now the proofs can actually be, you know, much more compact. And I think it's also really interesting because it also does expand the design space considerably for these type of, like, um, systems, because now I can sort of, like, assert to you that something happened in the chain at some period of point in time. So as long as you have headers, which really opens up the space for what you can do generally with, with these type of, type of technologies. And I think that's something that's, like, a little bit sort of, like, under tapped, under explored. I think this is, like, also a way that we can sort of like, you know, as such or start to introduce the things like start to the Bitcoin ecosystem in a way that doesn't require any fundamental changes, but sort of like gets you more warmed up with, with all of the, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, all of the technologies and primitives, which are now maturing very, very quickly. Uh, but I will say that like, you know, almost <laughs> whenever, whenever I think things are slowing down, there's a new Stark paper that gets dropped, right? And, you know, one of the new ones recently was by, um, you know, Stark, where they dropped something called Circle Stark, and there's M31, and now like, you know, A16Z, we released their own thing as well. So I think it's still moving, you know, pretty quickly uh, as well. And maybe it's not really sort of like sent to stone which one will be the final one, but that's why I think it's great that we can actually, you know, uh, external the solve off chain and get additional confidence and get better with the tooling and maybe get some feedback to move towards what we'll have there. Because to me, like, I, I don't see like an end state of Bitcoin without some some type of like proof system that's like, actually in it, maybe be stocked or anything, just because it's just so compatible with sort of like the ethos of validation and the ethos of, you know, sort of like being able to actually validate versus execute something. So to me, it's sort of like a thing. Uh, and I think, you know, people have been working towards this for, you know, many, many years now, even Starkware, you know, over 10 years ago. So, um, yeah, really excited about that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, comments? I know we're like, we have hosts dropping like flies, I guess, now that we're at uh, an hour 30. So happy, if folks have comments on tapered assets, like happy to have them. Yeah, super, go ahead. And then we'll have like a final question after this. Yeah, um, if, if I could re restate what I think was one of the points you were making in there, my friend. Uh, I think it was that um, it, it's okay for, you know, stable coins to take off because it actually helps Bitcoin. In that, you know, if you put a, if people start using stable coins and need increased capacity on the Lightning Network in order to facilitate these stable coin payments, um, that makes it so that all of us who are using the Lightning Network have more, you know, succeed, successful payments because there's more, you know, liquidity, more routes, more people who have the funds to forward your payment to the other destination. 
uh, I think that's part of the point you were trying to make there, and, uh, and I, I think that's true. Like, I, I can, like, if it is the point you're making, I think it's a true one. Um, other people using Bitcoin for things other than Bitcoin can help Bitcoin. Uh, it can help other Bitcoiners. Um, but I, don't, I still think that it's, it's a failure. It's, um, it's sometimes someone does something bad, and there's some effect that it has that is good for for me. But that doesn't mean I want them to do that bad thing. Um, and and the bad thing in this case is is that they they have they're, there's something that they want to buy that they can't use Bitcoin for, or that for, they think you know Bitcoin's not as good for them as me to use as me using you know a dollar or a stable dollar or whatever. And and for me, it's just like, well, what, what's the problem here? Why isn't it that that person doesn't think Bitcoin's the best money for that use case? And, and how can I fix that so that he does, so that so that he never has to use stable coins again? And that's the, that's where I come from it from. It would be even it might be good for Bitcoin if people use stable coins on Lightning, but it'd be even better for Bitcoin if people use Bitcoin on Lightning. Uh, yeah, I don't disagree. Uh, to me, it's sort of like, um, you know, I think you can't expect everything to happen all at once, right? I think adoption happens in phases, basically, and we see various stair steps that happen, you know, you know, throughout Bitcoin history, either related to, like, you know, either, like, large adoption events or individuals adopting it itself. To me, this is sort of like another one of these, like, stair step events, basically, to bring people into the ecosystem. All of a sudden, now, like, once they're sort of, like, in on the Bitcoin chain, well, it's not that hard to get Bitcoin now that you're already on the chain. But if you're completely outside in, maybe in, maybe in a place where you can't really actually even access these, this type of um, technology, either because of, like, you know, issues or infrastructure or local, um, you know, lack of like, local support, um, that becomes a lot more difficult. So to me, it's not like a uh, very, like, you know, binary black and white thing. I think that's, you know, sort of like a way to basically gain adoption, uh, you know, through this new event generally, and we won't get there all at once, right? Uh, I don't think we're going to wake up and all of a sudden have big organizations are going to happen and we're going to like, oh, yeah, everyone's going to be high-fiving. There's going to be, you know, a very long path. And I think this is one of those uh, you know, events. I think, you know, yeah, we have to sort of be sort of measured in sort of like what's realistic today and like where adoption is today and where some of the market is today. And what we can do, you know, as, uh, you know, engineers, entrepreneurs and, and, uh, and builders to basically, you know, the developers towards that. So, so you know, I, 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 I agree with you, but I think like, uh, you know, the real world uh, is, is a gradient, and you know things may move a little more slowly than you anticipate. Uh, and you need to sort of like you know find the levers that are available to you, you know, to like move forward to that grand goal, and not losing sight of it, but understanding that maybe some something may look a bit circuitous, but we're actually getting to that end, uh, you know, goal eventually. So, yeah, I think we're close to wrapping up. So, um, Willem Sims, Light, kind of any thoughts on Tabber assets before we move on to kind of the final question? Yeah, no, I think it's great. I think um, we focused a lot on like the, the stablecoin aspect of uh, Taproot assets, but I think it, it allows yeah to issue any asset. And I don't think it competes with Bitcoin as being money. How I, how I look at uh, Taproot assets, it's more like stocks. Um, and uh, when I look at the world right now, it's totally not permissionless. Someone in Egypt, for example, cannot buy any stock on like the New York Stock Exchange. And so once we have... Um, yeah, permissionless stocks um, on Bitcoin as separate assets, then you suddenly have a yeah, have a full permissionless world where anyone can buy any asset, and that's a world where I want to work towards. Um, that's on the on the more asset side, on the stablecoin side. I think um, I would agree with Super Desmond on the short term. I think um, ideally we want to move as fast as possible to a world running on Bitcoin, but. I think that you have to follow yeah, the different steps. Um, I think everybody knows this graph where you start as a digital collectible, then store of value, medium of exchange. And it's only at the end that you have a unit of account. And so I think stable coins is short term, something where we have to go through. Um, but yeah, that's how I think about the assets you have on the one hand, like more the assets, like the stocks um, and the stable coins. I'm, I'm mostly excited about yeah, basically the stock part of the, of the assets. Thank you, Will. Um, Sims, like any any type of access thoughts before we go to the last question? Um, I would just say that uh, I I think Taproot assets is uh, an interesting you know, implementation of like a, a so called you know, client side verification protocol, um, which makes the transfer of assets within the protocol you know, more scalable than other kinds of like token tokenization models on Bitcoin. Um, so it's, I, I think it's great to see the, um, the innovation in, uh, you know, experimentation in uh, having more kind of space efficient, um, scalable uh, tokenization protocols on Bitcoin. 
And I also think it'll be interesting to see the interplay between Taproot assets and not only Lightning, which has been envisioned already, but also uh, roll-ups on Bitcoin, um, bridging uh, Taproot assets uh, into roll-ups, but also bridging roll-up assets into Taproot assets. Mm -hmm. um, if the, you know, if if that's kind of where the liquidity um, and and activity ends up being. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see you know how that that particular ecosystem and, and interplay evolves. Yeah, exactly. Super excited to see all that, um, you know, come to fruition. Cool. So I think kind of the last thing, uh, last question, because cognizant of time, although this has been a great discussion and really want to be we're really grateful to our hosts um, for, you know, all of this, uh, you know, the great wealth of knowledge that they've shared on the Bitcoin protocol, kind of what future changes, you know, would be helpful to your project? What kind of are you thinking about what do you have your eyes on? We know there are a bunch of proposals uh, in the works currently. Uh, so I'll just kind of go in reverse order here and start back with you, Light. So I'm personally a, a, a big fan of verifiable computation and, and zero knowledge proofs for um, scaling and privacy and um, adding verifiable computation to Bitcoin layer one. So I would love to see opcodes that enable you know, verification of um, Stark or Snark or some other kind of you know cryptographic proof like that uh, directly on Bitcoin. It doesn't have to be you know a, a, a an opcode that's like specifically tailored to that. It could be more of like a collection of you know, mathematical primitives that you could use to build a verifier. It was very interesting to hear Louis posit earlier that opcat is enough to verify Stark on Bitcoin. Um, so you would love would love to dig into the research around that. Um, but, uh, also I think having something that would support, um, like recursive covenants would be really interesting as well to enable other kinds of, um, roll ups. Um, some of the work that, uh, uh, Salvatore from, uh, Ledger has been doing with, uh, like Matt is very interesting. Um, so yeah, those are, those are the kind of things that are like on my radar right now. Very cool. Sims, any additional thoughts from you on that? No, I mean, I just uh, echo the thoughts uh, prior. Yep. Awesome. Um, Willem? Yeah, I think uh, we, we take a more uh, neutral approach. I think there's a lot of components that can improve the security of the spider chain. Um, but I think uh, we first want to see adoption and then basically uh, um, if any of the components would happen, we will see then how uh, how we can improve the spider chain with those governments. So we're more neutral. Got it. Very cool. Super. Um, and like particularly, I'm curious if as as you've gone through implementing kind of BitVM, if you've noticed, you know, where there are bottlenecks and kind of what would be helpful in making BitVM a little bit more, you know, production ready. One of the things that is uh, the BitVM uses a lot, a lot of is pre-signed transactions. You create like dozens of them when you're setting up a BitVM contract. And if we had covenants, specifically, I would like a CTV. Uh, we wouldn't have to do that. You could, you could just make um, what one party could prepare a Bitcoin address and then prove that it's committed to this set of transactions that um, that we are currently using pre-signed transactions for. That's what I would like. If we could get CTV in, it would make um, it would simplify uh, the implementation of the VM. Yeah. Cool, awesome. Lalu, you want to bring it home? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, just thanks everyone for joining. I think cool conversation. I think also you know cool to just get these varying viewpoints together to actually even discuss and even exchange some of these ideas. So otherwise, I feel like you know it's definitely fair to people who are just like too insular and not listening to anything at all and not trying to like learn some lessons or even like you know dollar technology you know directly and to see how it can be you know used to uh, you know for the Bitcoin and everything else. So just thanks everyone for, for joining. I definitely learned a lot. And I'm, I'm definitely going to follow up on some additional stuff that I mentioned here around some of like the Alpcap with Stark stuff, uh, you know, stuff like that. And definitely be on the lookout for some new releases from us you know, very, very soon here. We're guessing exciting the code uh, you know, in the hopper. Uh, you know, then. Amazing. Um, well, thank you all again so much for listening. Thank you in particular 
um, to our guests for participating and giving us what is now, you know, you know, almost an hour and 45 minutes. We really, really, really appreciate your time. Uh, I think everybody listening, I've gotten tons of messages on the side about, you know, how great of a conversation this has been and, uh, you know, how appreciative they are for all of you doing the things you're doing, building the projects that you're building, um, and, you know, then sharing your knowledge. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for joining. We're super pleased to have you building on Bitcoin and building, you know, in the Bitcoin community. And, you know, we're excited to see all of you ship and all of us, you know, collectively to grow the Bitcoin community of users, developers, uh, and companies that are, you know, hoping to grow the pie. Um, so again, thank you so much. We just really appreciate your time and uh, appreciate your work. Thanks, everybody.